Hi there, I'm Mr. Manoj. Today I'm discussing IGCSE Paper 22, uh, May 2016. This is the first of the multiple choice question, which is based on the extended part of the curriculum. In this examination, out of 40 marks, A was given at 25 out of 40. Okay, so let's have a look. Whenever you do a multiple choice question, always remember you have around 45 minutes to do 40 questions, roughly about one minute per question. That's the usual speed you have to work with. Okay, if you read the question here, it talks about substance gaining energy, okay, and it changes from a regular ordered structure, which means that's something which is solid, and it's changing into a disordered structure that could be liquid or gas, and then if you read here, it says large distances between the particles, which means clearly this is gas. So ultimately, we understand this is solid changing into gas. And if you look at the four choices, boiling is liquid changing to gas. So that's not the answer there. Um, evaporation is liquid changing into gas. Melting is solid changing to liquid. But sublimation is the one in which the solid changes to gas. So that's the answer of this question there. Uh, moving on to question number two. In the chromatography experiment shown, which label represents the solvent front? Well, you should know this is basically the solvent, this origin line, sometimes called the starting line, datum line. Uh, that's the sample that we are investigating. This is the solvent which you see here, and the chromatography paper is dipped. Um, at a level which is below the the start line this what you see here is basically your solvent front that's basically the height up to which the liquid actually the solvent travels up so that's basically what solvent front is so that's why the answer was a the mixture it contains a mixture of different compounds present there and a chromatogram of x and three pure compounds pqr is shown as it is here now, which statement is not correct? Uh, this is something that you have to be very, very careful with because um, you know, this could you know, lead you off in a different direction of thinking. Which statement is not correct? Which means out of the four choices, three would be correct and one is not correct. We need to find out the one which is not correct. If you look at the first statement, a locating agent was used. Well, that's true because uh, if you look here, it's colorless, which means you really can't see the spots. So you need the, the locating agent. So A is correct. Um, B and R could be present. Now, they use the word could be present. Now, if you look at the, the results here, P is confirmed. Definitely, it's there. Um, and it says R, yeah, it's exactly the same height. So definitely that also is, looks it's definitely there so p and r definitely are in x so b is got is a correct statement so a is correct statement b is correct statement if you look at c p and r have different solubilities well that's important because um, if they have different solubilities you expect p and r to be at different heights and clearly r is more soluble that's why it's traveled more compared to p so clearly C is also a correct statement. But if you look at D, it says Q has greater RF value. Well, RF is called retention factor. Uh, good to know. RF equals to X over Y. That's the distance traveled by the solute. So this could be X. That's the distance traveled there. And Y is basically the distance travel between the solvent front and, and the, your start line. So that's usually what Y would be. So when you calculate that, clearly, if you look at the diagram, the, this question says Q has a greater RF. But then if you notice, Q actually has not traveled that much compared to R. So the RF value of this... Act okay, so let's move on to question number four. And this question talks about isotopes. So if you just for a moment try to recall the definition of isotopes, these are atoms, they have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. 
uh, a couple of statements given and you need to figure out which statements do you think are, are appropriate. Now, if you look at the first one, the atoms which have the same chemical properties because they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. Well, that's correct because the isotopes, they have the same number of protons, which means they also have the same number of electrons, which means the number of electrons in the outer shell should be same and that controls their chemical behavior. So one definitely is correct. Uh, their atoms, if one is correct, answer could be A, um, could be B, and that, that means C and D absolutely cannot be the correct answer. Now, if you look at the second statement, the atoms which have the same number of electrons, well, that part is correct. And neutrons, no, that's not possible. Which means two is not correct. It means this can't be the correct answer, which leaves you uh, with one and three as the only choice. So that's why B was the correct answer there. Moving on to question number five. Now, the question number five talks about which two atoms could combine to form a covalent compound. Well, don't forget, that's the one which is formed by sharing of electrons. If you look at W there, this guy has got one electron in the outer shell. So that means this is a metal. And metal means it cannot form a covalent co compound. So W is gone, which means this can't be the answer. This can't be the answer. So you have now two choices left. And if you look at the com the element Z, it has eight electrons. It means it's a noble gas. And if it's a noble gas, it means it wouldn't react either. So that means this can't be the answer, which clearly leaves you with C as the option. But you must understand why, because four means it's somebody in group number four, like carbon or silicon, and they share the electrons. Uh, having seven electrons, um, well, you could actually look at the periodic table. This is 17, which is chlorine. Uh, which is a uh, member of group 7. So uh, these will easily share the electron and form the covalent compound there. So the correct answer for this question was C. Next question, which statement describes the attractive forces between the molecules? Now, when you talk of intermolecular forces, we're talking of between, for example, uh, I'm talking of between CO2 and another CO2. That's important for you to understand. It's between two different molecules. Um, when we just look at forces between two molecules, we are basically going to talk about a force called Van der Waals force. So they're pretty weak forces which operates between simple molecules. Which means if you look at A, it, it doesn't hold good because strong covalent bond holds the molecules together. No, that doesn't make sense because you expect strong covalent bond inside the molecule, not between the molecules. So that's why A was not the correct choice. A strong ionic bond which holds molecules together. No, ionic bonds are found between the ions. For example, you have a sodium ion, you got a chloride ion, and they exist as sodium chloride. That's ionic lattice. They are held by ionic forces, not the molecule, uh, not NaCl and another NaCl. That's the statement um, B was. That's why it was wrong. If you look at C, they are weak forces, and well, if you look at that statement, it kind of holds correct for that. If you Look at CO2. Definitely weak forces, Van der Waals force is not exactly a very strong force. Uh, so C is the correct answer there. Um, and if you look at that statement, there are weak forces holds the ions in a lattice. That's not correct because um, the ions are held together in a lattice with very strong forces, strong electrostatic forces. They can't be weak. That's the mistake in that statement. So correct answer for that question was C. Question number seven, metals consist of a lattice of positive ions. Why aluminum is malleable? But malleable means if you if you strike aluminum metal, it, uh, you could flatten it out as a, as a sheet. You can make it more thinner. That means the layers of the metal ions must be able to slide over each other. So it, that's, that's why D was the correct choice. The metal ions are arranged in some kind of irregular rows and they have this positive, they're all positive ions, and they're all surrounded by a um, sea of um, electrons there everywhere. And if you're going to hit them with a the force, these layers simply slide, and that's how they can actually spread out, and that causes malleability. Um, let's have a look at question number eight. 
you got 16 grams of metal oxide and you got 12.8 grams of a metal and you got to use that information to find out the atomic the relative atomic mass of n well since i have metal oxide and metal i could find out the mass of oxygen by subtracting 12.8 from 16 so i'm going to take 16 minus 12.8 and that's going to give me the amount of the the oxygen which is there so 16 minus 12.8 gives me 3.2 so I, I get 3.2 grams of oxygen now I need to convert this into moles of oxygen so I'm going to divide this by 16 so keeping in mind that moles equals to mass by air that gives me 0 0.2 so what I have done is I have found out the moles of oxygen. Now, if I look at the formula there, it's MO, which means the ratio between them is one ratio one, which means the moles of metal M is also equal to 0 0.2 moles. So I have now moles of the metal M. I also have the mass of metal M there. So I know the formula there is n equals to m by ar so the questions ask us to find ar which means the ar equals to m by n so mass is 12.8 divided by 0 0.2 so 12.8 divided by 0 0.2 it's 12.8 divided by 0 0.2 gives us 64 so that's that's 64 and that is why b was the correct answer there for question number nine it talks about how many moles of calcium carbonate that's calcium carbonate will give us 24 cm cube of carbon dioxide well that's carbon dioxide there now if you look at the ratio between calcium carbonate and carbon dioxide the ratio clearly is one ratio one that means one mole of that will give me one mole of that now don't forget one mole of any gas at rtp is 24 dm cube now the 24 dm cube can be written as 24 of uh, thousand cm cube so what it what it comes down to is that one calcium carbonate gives us 24,000 cm cube but the question wants you to only find out how much calcium carbonate is required to give 24 cm cube so i'm going to put 24 cm cube here so to get 24 cm cube of carbon dioxide how much calcium carbon is all we need is a little bit of cross multiplication there and uh, therefore the value of x would be equal to 24 divided by 24,000 which gives us uh, 0 0.001 so remember x would be equal to um, 24 divided by 24,000 and that's basically how we get this answer okay let's have a look at question number 10 um, before we do that just uh, let's rub all these things out to create some space for us for working okay uh, the question talks about we are of electrolysis of molten zinc chloride and uh, in the diagram this is this is anode there positive that's anode uh, and uh, what I see here is negative that's my cathode and at anode electrons are always lost these are good concepts to keep in mind at cathode electrons are gained and uh, keeping in mind there is something called as O I L R I G oxidation is losing reduction is gaining of electron so that's oxidation going on there and that is reduction these are good concepts to keep in mind so the question says which statement do you think is correct oxidation takes place at the electrode X um, well that's the equation given there um, anode is positive so cl minus comes there and it's losing the electron and that's exactly what should happen at the anode so obviously this is the right answer there uh, in case you're wondering why b is not correct it says oxidation occurs in uh, y well 
this is plus 2 and is changing into 0. If the oxidation number decreases, it's called reduction. So this is not oxidation, this is reduction. Um, and C is not correct, it says reduction occurs at electrode X. Um, at this is anode. You're not, electrons are not supposed to be gained at anode, they're supposed to be lost. That's why this equation is not correct in the first place. And D says reduction occurs at electrode Y. Well, reduction is, now look at that, that's minus 1 and that's changing to, this is oxidation number is 0 there. So minus 1 to 0, oxidation number has gone up. So it's actually oxidation, it's not reduction. That statement is not right. So that's why A was the correct answer. Okay, uh, question number 11 uh, talks about um, an element uranium. Uh, once again, a point to be noted that the mass numbers are now mentioned at the bottom, uh, not at the top. So you will find um, uranium written as 235 down and the atomic numbers are on the top. Okay, uh, the question says which which label part do you think uranium belongs to? Well, and we know it's an energy source. We, uranium is used in nuclear warheads, nuclear reactors. So definitely this part. And uranium is an element, it's not a compound, so definitely not that. And it's radioactive because it gives off energy because of radiation. So that's why D was the correct choice. Question number 12 talks about a simple cell. And uh, there are two elements, metal X and metal Y. And the question says, for which pair of metals would the electrons flow from X to Y? Well, if the electrons has to flow from X to Y, that means X has to be more reactive. And the one which is more reactive is always the anode. And in a simple cell, good to know, anode is negative. So that means the one who is more reactive. So all you have to do is check which one X is more reactive. Definitely not copper. Copper is not, not much reactive. Choices between C and D. Uh, out of Fe and zinc, clearly zinc is more reactive, so that's why D was the correct answer. Question number 13. This is an energy level diagram for combustion of methane. Don't forget, whenever you burn hydrocarbons, energy is released, exothermic reaction, and um, they're shown by negative values. And the question says, which row do you, gives the equation and the correct energy change? Um, well, that's methane and it's being burned and you get CO2 and H2, they're all in gaseous state. So it's exothermic. It means the energy change has to be negative, so it can't be positive. So these two are completely gone. So now the choice is between these two. And if I look at that equation there, the mistake here is H2 is liquid. But I don't see H2 liquid there. I see H2 gas there, which means B is the correct answer. Moving on to question number 14, um, liquid X reacts with solid Y to form a gas. Which two diagrams show suitable method for investigating the rate? Okay, if you look at one, this is not correct because you, if you're trying to collect the gas into the syringe, that obviously is not a good idea because that cotton wool, which is usually put there to prevent the acid spray, is going to allow some gas to escape. So that's not a good thing which means one definitely is not the answer, which means this can't be the answer, this can't be the answer. So now you have two choices there. If you notice what I'm doing is out of the four choices, I'm eliminating two absolutely ones which cannot be. Um, if you look at the third diagram, even that looks to be very odd because if there's a reaction there and you're trying to measure the change in mass, now that's only possible if the gas was allowed to get out but you put a stopper there, which means no gas is going to go, which means this number is not going to change. So third also is not correct. So this is not correct. So obviously, this has to be the right answer. But anyway, let's start understand the logic. In this reaction, as you see here in this setup, all the gases that is going to be produced will go in the gas range. That's exactly what you want to do. So that's why diagram number two and four are the correct one. In this one, the reason why it's correct is when the reaction happens, the gases are being allowed to escape. Remember, the cotton wool is just to prevent the acid spray. It doesn't stop the flow of gas. Question number 15, uh, we're talking of 
energy of collisions between particles change? How do they change when concentration and temperature change? Please remember, the energy of the particles can change only because of temperature. If temperature increases, you must have studied kinetic energy increases and uh, the particles collide um, more effectively and we have a faster rate of reaction and so on. I'm sorry. Uh, but then, as far as catalyst is concerned, it, it can only change the, the activation energy required. It doesn't change the energy of the, of the particles. So when temperature ch changes uh, or increases, there is, there's definitely going to be higher energy. So um, this doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense. Now, if you look at concentration, remember concentration cannot increase the energy of the particle. The only one, as I said earlier, who can do that is temperature. So, which means this is not right. So, that leaves us with C as the option. If concentration increases, energy doesn't change, but temperature increases, definitely the energy will change. So, that's why C was the correct answer. Question number 16. This is methanol being manufactured by a reaction of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. That's the equation given there. The reaction is exothermic, so don't forget, if it's exothermic, it means the enthalpy change for, of this reaction is negative. Um, that's one gas mole, that's two gas moles, so we have three gas moles on the left and we have only one gas mole on the right. Don't forget, if there's nothing written there, it means there is one. What change in temperature and pressure increases the yield of methanol? That, that means you want to shift this equilibrium to the right. Now, that means, if you look at the temperature there, since the, the forward reaction is exothermic, so if you, if you decrease the temperature, the equilibrium will shift in such a way so as to increase the temperature, which means it's going to favor the side which is going to give more heat. It's going to favor the exothermic direction. Now, since it's exothermic in the forward, it means a low temperature will definitely help equilibrium to go to the right. So you, you probably have to look at A and B as your possible answers. So C and D are completely ruled out. Now if you look at the pressure, I have only one gas mole on my right. I have three on my left, which means I have less gas mole on my right, which means I need to look at something which has a high pressure there. At high pressure, equilibrium will go to the side with less gas mole. So pressure should be high. So that's why B was the right choice. Question number 17 talks about reduction reaction. Well, reduction is where the oxidation number, if, you, if I remember I discussed it earlier, it should decrease. So let's have a look at whose oxidation number is decreasing. There you go. If you look at C there, it's 3 plus and changing to 2 plus. The oxidation number is going down. That's reduction. So C definitely is the right answer there. Uh, B is not the answer because that's 2 plus changing to 3 plus. That's oxidation. And 2 plus changing to 3 plus, uh, well, that equation is not correct. Because if Fe2 plus gains the electron, it shouldn't be forming Fe3. It actually should be forming Fe1 plus. Well, that's not right. Um, D is not correct because 3 plus is changing to 2 plus, which means that's reduction going on. Uh, this is, sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon. This is Fe3 plus losing the electron, which means that number should actually be more than 3 plus. So that's why D is not the correct answer. Question number 18, which statement are properties of an acid? Uh, acids react with ammonium sulfate? No, acid don't react with ammonium. These are salts, acid don't react with salts. So statement A, and so A and B are ruled out. Acid turns red litmus paper blue. No, we know it's the other way around. So, which means the uh, well, answer has to be D then, because both statements are not correct. Question number 19. Which row describes whether an amphotric oxide reacts with acid and bases? Well, amphotric oxides, they do react with acid and bases. So, that's why D is the obvious choice, um, because it's yes for both the situations. And the example of amphotic oxide, what you should remember is aluminum oxide, uh, zinc oxide and lead oxides are other examples to think of. Question 20 talks about silver chloride is insoluble in water. It's a white precipitate. It's good to know that. Which two substances can be used to make silver chloride? Well, 
um, if you look at barium chloride, it has barium ions and chloride ions and the silver ions, this is silver nitrate solution, the silver ions from here can combine with the chloride ions here to form the silver chloride. So A is the obvious choice. Uh, B is not the answer because silver can't react with acid. It's less reactive than the hydrogen, so it can't uh, react with acids. Hydrochloric acid and well, silver bromide is a, a pale yellow um, solid and it's actually an insoluble itself. So there is no formation of silver chloride with that. So likewise, D is not the correct answer. Silver iodide is insoluble. It's yellow solid. So there's no reaction there. Question 21. Where in the periodic table is the met metallic character of the element greatest? Well, if you look at the periodic table design, it's something like that. In your AS classes, um, you, would, you would study this as uh, S block and um, P block and D block and F block. That's the design of a periodic table. The metals are found here on the left hand side. So that's why the answer had to be these two. And as you go down, you have stronger metallic behaviors shown. So that's why you have to look up that as a possible option there. So that's why A was the correct answer. They become more met more heavy metals, uh, more metal behavior being shown as you go down. Rubidium is in group one. Which statement about rubidium is not correct? Be careful of these kind of questions, as I said earlier. So out of four choices, four, three are correct. One is not correct. It has a higher melting point than lithium. Well, that is the one which is not correct because in metals, you must remember as you go down, the melting point actually becomes less. So the bigger the metal ions, lower the melting point. So that's why A was not the correct answer. B, C, D are absolutely correct statements. Question number 23, uh, which elements could be transition? And you must remember transition elements from your um, the topic 9 uh, of your curriculum are the elements which have high density they have high melting points so which means P and Q could be ruled out answer could be R and S and uh, we're talking of transition elements with which are metals and they, they have good electrical conductivity and they have high density so that means that can't be the correct answer either and they always they form colored compounds so that's another evidence that that can't be the correct answer so which means uh, d should be the correct answer it fulfills all the conditions of transition elements question 24 which element is a gas that does not form a compound again if you see the examiners they keep on asking this kind of style of questions which does not form a compound with potassium, that means you're looking for somebody who's not reactive. And if you look at all your choices, that's the one which is the noble gas group, B. So B is the correct answer because it's in group noble gas group. It has fully filled out to shell. It wouldn't react with anyone. Question 25 is talks about thermal decomposition. This is from topic 10, metals uh, of your curriculum. It talks of thermal decomposition. Basically, that means you're heating magnesium nitrate and you're heating magnesium hydroxide and what are the possible products so this is a recall kind of a question and group two metal nitrate when you heat you end up getting a metal oxide so you should get metal oxide you should get nitrogen dioxide and you should get the oxygen there so if you look at all your options um there you go and if you, if you heat metal hydroxide you should get metal oxide plus h2 so everything is correct in option a uh, B is not correct because of that. That's not correct. Uh, C is not correct because you're supposed to get three things, not two. Uh, the NO2 is missing. And similarly, D is not correct because hydrogen, that's the mistake there. Question number 26. Which property is not considered as a typical metallic property? Um, they're all good conductors of heat. Um, they have no no metals usually have high melting points so that's why B is the correct answer there. which property is not considered as a typical metallic so it's not usually expected of metals to have low melting points
Question number 27. Um, this is again from uh, topic 10 of your curriculum. Uh, which substances in the iron are removed? Uh, well, basically, when you're converting iron into to steel, the, the cast iron that you get from blast furnace contains a lot of carbon and you want to get rid of that. So the oxygen combines with the carbon to change into carbon dioxide. So answer has to be A or B, uh, not C and D. And then the carbon dioxide is actually an acidic oxide. And that's why calcium oxide reacts with calcium oxide is base. So calcium oxide can then combine with carbon dioxide. So that's why this is not the correct option because carbon dioxide is an acidic oxide. So everything is correct for A and that's why that was the correct answer. Question 28, why craolite used during the extraction of aluminium by electrolysis? Well, craolite, this is from your electrochemistry lesson, is used to lower the melting point of um, electrolyte because aluminium oxide has got a pretty high melting point, so it makes the process very expensive if you want to melt it and then electrolyze it, so it helps to reduce that cost. So that's the, is again, is a recall-based question. Topic 29. Uh, sorry, question 29. The diagram shows an experiment to investigate how paint affects the rusting of Fe. Okay, now remember painting is one of the methods to prevent rusting, which means it wouldn't rust. It means it wouldn't react with the oxygen. But then Fe here, which is exposed, will react with the oxygen and air has got one-fifth of oxygen as an approximation. So if this was the complete air, about one-fifth of this is going to get used up. So I will expect to see water level rising up here uh, not in this case because there is no rusting happening so the oxygen remains as it is in this tube so as the oxygen is get used up there's some kind of a vacuum being created so the water gets sucked into the tube if this tube was filled with absolutely pure oxygen the water would go right on top so which means um, the correct answer would be d the water will rise in the tube p uh, but it will not have any effect on tube Q. Analysis of its atmosphere. It has carbon dioxide 4% and that's pretty high compared to what we have. Uh, and nitrogen is less than what we have and oxygen is definitely more than. This information will be available in topic 11 of your curriculum. So which gases are present um, in the atmosphere of the plants? Higher percentage compared to the earth. Well, clearly carbon dioxide is much higher compared to what we have. So the answer has to be A or B. And uh, oxygen, well, oxygen is 24%. We don't have 24% oxygen. We wish we had that, but uh, as of now, we're struggling with about 19% oxygen. So that's why A was the correct answer there. Question 31. How are the oxides of nitrogen being formed? Well, that that's would be a simple reaction between nitrogen and oxygen. That's if you remember due to high temperature of the engine inside the engine, and the air which comes into the engine contains nitrogen, and some of the nitrogen will combine with oxygen to form the oxides of nitrogen. Uh, good to remember the catalytic converters are designed to get rid of that. Question number 32. This is the famous Haber process equation. The forward reaction is exothermic, which means, good to remember, it means delta H is negative for the forward rea reaction. What is the effect of increasing the pressure on the percentage yield and the rate of ammonia? Well, if you're going to increase pressure, so you need to check how many gas moles you have on your left hand side. That's one plus three, so you've got four gas moles on your left and you've got two gas moles on your right. So if you increase and you want to shift if you increase pressure, it will go to side with less gas moles. So the percentage yield increases because equilibrium shifts right. So increases, that means A and B can't be the answer. It has to be C or D. But what happens to the rate? Well, if you increase pressure, you must remember that the volume of gas becomes less. So they come close to each other and therefore the number of collision increases. So this increases the rate of reaction. So that's why answer has to be D. Question 33. The contact process is used in the, for the manufacture of sulfuric acid. Which statement is not correct? So again, which, which means out of four statements, three are correct and one is not correct. It says a catalyst of iron is used. No, that is not correct. Because if you remember, 
Fe is used for Haber process and for contact process we use a catalyst V2O5 which is vanadium 5 oxide um, we could also call it vanadium penta oxide so that's why um, A is the correct answer for this question question 34 uh, which substance do you think can be removed by lime? You, uh, actually, they gave you a hint. Lime is calcium oxide. So good to know. Calcium oxide is a metal oxide. It's a base, uh, which means you need to check who is an acid who could react. Ammonia is a base. No reaction. Sodium chloride salt. No reaction. Sodium hydroxide is a base. No reaction. Sulfuric acid. That's the one who will react with it. And that is why D is the correct answer there. Question number 35, mm -hmm. you're talking of petroleum and separation. This is from the organic chemistry and you're supposed to find out who is X, Y and Z. Well, if you look at the, the sequencing, you're supposed to know the fractions of petroleum comes in, in a certain sequence and it's very, very important for you to remember that. So uh, as you go up, the fuel becomes more li lighter, more purer. Uh, down is where all the heavy fuels are and that's basically why D was the, the correct choice there. This is kind of a recall based situation. I would advise you to memorize the fractions of petroleum in the particular sequence as it is mentioned. Which compound is not an alkane? Well, alkanes are supposed to be the ones who have a carbon-carbon single covalent bond. Um, this looks to be an alkane. This is butane and this is actually um, two CH3s which are connected this way. And uh, then it has an H and there's a CH3 so clearly I don't see any double bond so B is also an alkane uh, but if you look at this one here that's where the double bond is that's supposed to be that's supposed to be carbon carbon double bond carbon and carbon so that's butene so this is butene that's compound C which I'm trying to draw and that's the alkene there and that again is an alkane and that compound is actually a carbon connected with three CH3s. That's why it's written that way. So clearly I do not see any double bond in it. So that's why C was the correct answer. CH3, CH2, C, double bond, O, OH. I, I purposely opened up the structure to make you understand how esters are formed. And this is going to react with ethanol. Now, ethanol is CH3CH2OH. Now, how do you make an ester? Is you remove the OH from the carboxylic acid and you remove the H from the alcohol, and, and you basically just go this way and then you flip the alcohol around and write this way. Which means when you work the ester out, it's CH3, that's the CH3 there, and CH2. And then I have a C double bond O, and that's all gone. And then I'm going to flip the alcohol the other way around. So I'm basically going to write it this way. So I have an oxygen there, that's the oxygen. And then I have CH2, that's a CH2, and then I get a CH3. So that's the ester plus the H2. So that's a good way to understand that. And if I look at all my options, uh, if you look at D, so I have one, two, three. That's one, two, three. And this is two carbons there. So that's the two carbons. So that's why D is the right choice. Question number 38. What's the advantage of producing ethanol by fermentation of sugar compared to a catalytic addition of steam to ethene? Well, um, Ethene is a hydrocarbon, which means uh, it has to come from fossil fuels, breaking down of large hydrocarbons. Um, so that's going to put pressure on our on our resources. But uh, if you're going to use fermentation of sugar, that's basically a plant product. So that's why D would be the correct appropriate choice there. Um, question 39: In which row are the monomer and polymer chain correctly matched? Well. That's the monomer. You need to work this out. How to, how to make polymer is, if this is the polymer, just to give you some idea. This is CH double bond CH CH3. So if I'm going to make a polymer out of that, the trick is um, to understand that I'm going to do this. This at least gives you an idea of how to make one basic unit of the. This is always what a polymer structure will look like. 
these two carbons are these two carbons here. Now, if you look carefully, it has an H and it has the CH3. So I'm just going to copy that. That's H and that's the CH3. It doesn't matter what I write top and down. This carbon here has an H and it has a CH3. So I'm just going to copy down H and a CH3. So that's basically one unit and I can just go on repeating it. So if you look carefully here, it's a CHCH3. See, that's that's a CHCH3. CHCH3. That's the second one, CHCH3. And exactly the same thing follows. So that's basically why A is the correct answer. I, I could write this in this form. Question 40, which two polymers have the same link, bonding the monomers together? Uh, um, nylon, you must know, has the amide link. That's the NH, C, double bond O. That's the amide link um, in nylon. And carbohydrate has the ester link. So that's the ester link there. So obviously A is not the correct choice. Nylon and protein. Protein also is made up of amino acids. And they also have the same link. In fact, the, the, the NHCO link in a protein can also be called as a peptide link. That's why B was the correct answer. Well, uh, that finishes our, our question paper. I, I hope you found the video useful. Uh, please do give your comments and that will help me to you know, make my videos better for the next time. Your comments are very valuable and all your suggestions are always welcome. Um, I will definitely try to improve on the features as we go along. This is a learning curve for me and hopefully I'm going to put more videos in future. So, see you again. Ciao.